It's five past eight, Buenas stars. So good morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us today in our international rounds. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Jack Richick. I hope that I pronounced your last name correctly, who is the Associate Chief of Cardiology at uh, CHOP at the Children's Hospital of uh, Philadelphia. And he's going to talk today about a very interesting topic, which is cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular adaptation to the fontan circulation. So, Dr. Richick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for joining us today. Sure. Well, thank you all very much uh, for this uh, opportunity. And uh, uh, good morning to all of my Canadian and international friends uh, who are uh, spending some time with us today. Um, the topic I want to talk about for the next uh, 45 plus or so minutes uh, is what you see here, the cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular adaptation to the Fontan circulation. Um, yeah, this was a, a title that was suggested um, from talks that I've given previously on this. Uh, I uh, thought it was important to keep the word adaptation here, but really uh, I'm going to um, take the liberty of um, reinterpreting adaptation to perhaps include also maladaptation, uh, which I think many of us recognize is in fact the, the situation when it comes to the Fontan circulation. Um, and uh, many of us are already familiar with, um, with this, this notion. Let me see if my slides will advance. There we go. So uh, starting out at the very beginning here and, and building uh, on this concept of um, what we have done for this incredibly uh, complex um, and interesting birth defect of the heart, one that really uh, is um, continuing to consume a huge amount of our resources. Uh, and I would venture to say, certainly for any of our growing adult congenital heart disease programs around the world, is having an increasing um, amount of uh, expenditure of energy and resources uh, to manage these particular patients. Um, and we're talking about single ventricle, which itself is not a, a, a one category diagnosis, but one that includes an inadequate ability to perform the task of propulsion either to the pulmonary or the systemic circulation. And as we know, there can be a variety of different types. These can be either single left, single right dominant, or some combined uh, variant in some way. Um, in a very conservative manner, what is the scope of this condition? Despite the fact that, as I just said, we're uh, uh, expending growing, increasing resources in managing these patients from the cardiovascular and non-cardiovascular uh, perspective, what can we learn from basic uh, incidence and prevalence data that can give us a sense of uh, what the, the magnitude is vis-a-vis -vis the spectrum of development of uh, single ventricle within what we see in other forms of congenital heart disease. So this is um, the paper I use predominantly to identify um, the frequency of various forms of congenital heart disease. It's the, uh, the Hoffman-Kaplan paper in Jack from 2002 where uh, I like the way they determine this. Uh, and again, as a pediatric cardiologist and as a fetal cardiologist myself, uh, the data was provided in the incidence of congenital heart disease per million live births. In the United States today, there's about 4 million live births. Uh, I don't know what it is in Canada um, or, or, or other parts uh, of the world. Uh, but yet the uh, percentages, the incidence, so should be relatively stable uh, from geography to geography. What you see here is the prevalent, the incidence, again, of uh, these various conditions, transposition, tetralogy, VSD, and all forms of congenital heart disease. And for conservative estimate of single ventricle, if you combine tricuspid atresia, double inlet left ventricle, and hypoplastic left heart syndrome, which really excludes still a fair number of other conditions, this is the number you come up with, about 567, so under about 600 per million live births. So doing some quick math, again, for the United States, about uh, 4 uh, million live births per year. That number is going down. 
uh, but nevertheless, it's, it hovers around that, that value. It means that there are about 2,000 individuals born each year with single ventricle type congenital heart disease. If you believe some of the additional uh, presumptions and other quick calculations that Eve Dudikam and the uh, Australian New Zealand group have done, uh, then we have an estimate of about 60 to 80,000 pe people alive today with single ventricle type congenital heart disease. And that number is growing, and in particular growing within the adult congenital heart realm because we are demonstrating increasing success in our early interventions and our early management of these individuals. And basically, what is the strategy for how we do that? Uh, very categorically, uh, neonates that are born with limited blood flow, limited systemic flow or unobstructed flow, undergo some form of initial operation to create balance between the pulmonary and systemic circulations, then undergo a uh, a superior cable pulmonary connection in the first few months of life, ultimately getting them to the point where they are then candidates for the Fontan procedure, somewhere between two to four years of age. How many uh, individuals make it through this particular rigor early on is, I think, an important uh, uh, question to ask and, and one that, that we asked within the confines of our own institution uh, we have a, a delivery unit at the Children's Hospital, and so we looked at a consecutive series of a little bit over 500 patients who presented prenatally with a variety of forms of single ventricle. And we asked the question, what's the likelihood if we make a prenatal diagnosis of single ventricle at 20 weeks, that that mother will, or father, family, will have a child that is at least six months out post-Fontan care. So again, many papers out there looking at uh, stage one reconstructive outcomes, Glenn outcomes, Fontan outcomes. In this particular study, we really wanted to look uh, comprehensively at all forms of single ventricle and say, okay, single ventricle, how many make it to about four plus years of age uh, after the Fontan operation? There were very few studies really that had done that uh, to date. What we learned was um, uh, 348 out of the 500 were uh, survival with intention to treat to birth, and of those, 234 survived six months post Fontan. So, the point I'm getting at here is that, again, from that, that mother that gets a prenatal diagnosis at 20 weeks, uh, what can we say about uh, globally how many of those patients will make it through the Fontan operation? It's about two thirds today. And um, I think that's a fascinating number that suggests, again, and supports the concept uh, that the majority of fetuses diagnosed with single ventricle will survive today. So this is a, a growing number of individuals who are, for the vast majority, again, of cases are going to make it into the adult realm. Now, as we all know, survival is not the end of the story, but rather the beginning uh, in terms of how we now need to deal with these unique individuals uh, who uh, many have said, I certainly would concur, never walked the face of the earth before. Uh, prior to uh, what we've been able to do in the last 30, 40 years, we haven't systematically been able to create a pathway of survival, but now we can. Um, and what can we now do to take those individuals that are surviving and push the frontier further to say that we can create a normal quality and duration of life for these unique individuals? Because I think no matter which data you combine from around the world, this is pretty much the 25 year curve for mortality following a Fontan. It's about 80% um, survival post Fontan. Uh, and perhaps this, this uh, curve takes a bit of a steeper uh, dive as we get out beyond 25 years from the Fontan itself. But this is pretty much, I think, what the data supports uh, from all the major studies. However, if you look at the morbidity aspect of this, um, morbidity is not too much of a player in the early years of life, 
but certainly as you enter adolescence and beyond, there are going to be very few, if any, individuals with a Fontan circulation who will be free of some form of morbidity uh, that in many ways is quite unique to this particular circulation. And then ultimately, it's the accrual of these morbidities that then influence the mortality and begin to steepen the dive of the curve as these patients grow into their later adult years. I think it's always helpful and important to remember um, uh, Fontan's original intentions and a uh, direct quotation from this original paper, which is often cited. Uh, but I'll emphasize the fact that uh, Francis Fontan himself said this procedure is not an anatomical correction, which would require the creation of a right ventricle, but a procedure of physiological pulmonary blood flow restoration with suppression of right and left blood flow mixing. The intention of the Fontan operation originally was not as an end-all solution or cure, but rather, at the time, a way to avoid the need for recurrent shunt placement and to treat cyanosis, because in essence, it would direct systemic venous return uh, into the pulmonary circulation. And that was the goal at that point in time, not necessarily for it to be the destination that we have created it uh, as we see it today. But there is a price that we pay for the suppression of mixing and increased arterial saturation. And it relates to the adaptations or maladaptations that I'm going to discuss with you uh, in the next few minutes. Um, I mostly see children and uh, occasionally they, they do ask some interesting questions. I do my best uh, based on, on, uh, on age of the patient in front of me to explain to them and to their parents uh, what we're dealing with. Um, and then one day as I was trying to explain the Fontan circulation to this nine-year-old and said there was no pump um, and explained the, the purpose of the pump and such, he asked, of course, the obvious question, if there's no pump, how does the blood circulate? What makes the blood go round if it's not being pumped in any way? I think this is a very fundamental question uh, and one that uh, as it relates to the Fontan circulation, I'm not sure we still have answered fully. So let me spend a minute here describing to you what, what, what I think is the, the dilemma at the moment and where some of the deficiencies of understanding exist. It was only about 400 years ago, less than 400 years ago, when William Harvey finally correctly described the circulation. Galen, for uh, centuries, uh, had described it incorrectly, and uh, very little progress had been made up until William Harvey and his book, uh, De Motu Cordis, where it was finally clear that veins returned to the heart, arteries uh, delivered oxygenated blood away from the heart, and that in fact, um, this was driven by a two pump system, a right and a left ventricle. Again, left ventricle perfusing the body and right ventricle perfusing the lungs. Now here comes along this birth defect of the heart and we don't have that other pumping chamber. We have a single ventricle, and that single ventricle we know obligatorily must deliver blood to the body. So how does the blood flow to the lungs? What are the determinants that influence blood flow in a Fontan circulation? I don't think there's a single answer to this, but uh, if there's anything you take away from my talk today, it would be, I think, um, uh, having our community think a bit more deeply about the various determinants and contributors to what drives blood in any individual with a Fontan circulation, realizing that there are maybe multiple variables and that the influence of any one variable may be greater in one particular individual than in another. So let me show you what I mean by that um, and give you, give you some examples. And I've broken this down into three categories of determinants. There are those that are extrinsic to the cardiopulmonary system. What are things that can drive blood? Well, your peripheral musculature, we know that that's important, your venous capacitance and tone, your intravascular volume will all contribute to getting that blood to move forward in some way or another. 
within the lungs themselves, the pulmonary system plays a key role. <clears throat> we know that uh, negative inspiration through the thoracic cage expenditure and diaphragmatic performance likely drives blood into the thorax from the periphery. And then there's the lung itself acting as a resistor to a degree and therefore the lung size, its arborization and development of the vascular tree, the pulmonary vascular endothelial function, these, this phenomenon of microthromboemboli that dissolve and are formed, all contribute to impedance to flow through the lungs when there is no pump. And then there's the cardiac system. Important features there are the, the circuit pathway and architecture to provide the most uh, efficient flow characteristics that one can design, the rhythm, diastolic ventricular relaxation mechanics, and systolic ventricular contraction is important. And I'm going to suggest perhaps one of the most important features that we really have not studied and perhaps ignored to a degree. And that's this idea that when the AV valve descends to the apex, no matter what AV valve you're talking about, be it a mitral valve and tricuspid atresia, or a tricuspid valve and hypoplastic left heart syndrome, its descent to the apex expands the atrium, which during systole then aspirates blood from the pulmonary veins, which is an important active driver of blood through the pulmonary circuit. And it, in fact, when there is no upstream ventricle, could very well be an important feature that influences flow in the Fontaine circulation. Now, of all these features, which of these are, are actually truly uh, active and propulsive? There are perhaps only three. Your peripheral musculature, your negative inspiratory effort through diaphragmatic and thoracic musculature, and this systolic ventricular contraction phenomenon. These are three positive active processes and I, again, what I think I'm suggesting to you is a, is a perspective uh, in which uh, way to look at what drives blood, and then we can understand where the deficiencies are, and perhaps what which of these features may or may not be modifiable to further augment blood flow when we don't have that pump. The physiological consequences are well known to us. This results in central venous hypertension, a relatively low cardiac output uh, with all of uh, the features of an impaired uh, ability to deliver a normal quantity of blood flow, uh, particularly at rest and during uh, periods of demand, as well as impaired chronotropy. We have a Fontan circulation that gives us survival for 25 years, but then we also, during this period, see the adaptation or maladaptation that is uniform in all the organs uh, that, are, that are part of the human body. Um, and what I want to do next is dive in a little bit more into each one of these uh, and to discuss some of the features that uh, result in this, quote, adaptation or maladaptation uh, and uh, present them to you uh, in, a, in a unifying manner. Uh, a quick model for why we may be seeing some of these and what may be contributing to some of these. Um, we have the inherent organ system abnormalities that exist in utero from the get-go. The design of various organs may be different when there is the complex birth defect of a single ventricle. When the cardiovascular system is designed poorly, perhaps other organs like the brain and perhaps even liver and such may also be different in very fundamental ways. We are subjecting these individuals to the consequences and rigors of surgical reconstruction. And then we leave them with a circulation that itself is faulty and has its own stressors, that of a Fontan circulation. So going from fetus to adult, we have this cumulative layered accrual of complication with a variability in a wide range of outcomes. What are the biological mechanisms? What's modifiable? And the genetic influences on these are, of course, critically important. So we have the combination of substrate, 
chronic physiology, and injury that all come together to contribute and influence the adaptations that we see. Let's talk about some of these individual complications and let's start with the heart. Now, this is a paper from um, the Cincinnati group, which I think has done a nice job essentially looking at some of the cardiovascular changes, particular vascular changes in uh, individuals who themselves have uh, unfortunately succumbed um, to the single ventricle Fontan circulation in some manner or another. So some of this information is interestingly biased by that. Uh, however, it's the first time I've seen some of these, these particular findings, which is, you know, makes sense that you would see these types of things. Um, but this paper described the unique histopathological abnormalities in the central arteries and veins of Fontan and subjects when looking at the descending aorta, and this is in patients without reconstructed aorta, so native aorta, but single ventricle Fontan. The um, uh, histopathology showed thickened elastic laminae with increased extracellular ground substances and loss of medial elastic fibers. When looking at the inferior vena cava, not surprisingly, structure under sustained high pressure, the Fontan IVC shows marked medial changes with increased muscularization and fibrosis, uh, as you see here. And I think we probably haven't really studied this too much, all of these various findings, to really dive into what the chronic changes may be, which itself may then influence uh, the status of these patients. Uh, a very close second to the cardiovascular system is a, a circulation that we're now beginning to understand just a little bit better and that's the lymphatic circulation. And of course, the lymphatic circulation is going to be affected when you have elevated central venous hypertension. It itself increases lymph tissue fluid uh, generation and is also an impediment to drainage. This leads to lymphatic insufficiency. The lymphatic stressors exist in all patients, but the the insufficiency to the extent of manifesting as either protein losing enteropathy or plastic bronchitis uh, is evident in only a fraction of patients. Now, why is that so, I think is, is quite interesting. Uh, here you see an unfortunate young man with, uh, with protein losing enteropathy and severe body wasting and uh, ascites. And um, I'm sure many of us, if not all of us, have seen the, the casts that are brought up by some of our patients who unfortunately suffer from plastic bronchitis. Both of these are a consequence of lymphatic insufficiency. And a lot of uh, um, uh, light has been shined on this area, this dark area, by my colleague Yoav Dori at, at CHOP and many others around the world, uh, Vibika Yortal and, and many others that are focusing their attention uh, and bringing their wisdom to, to this particular area. Um, as it relates to PLE, we know that the liver is a very, very highly um, uh, congested organ um, in a lymphatic circulation, uh, in, a, in a Fontan circulation, with a very high density of lymphatic structure that oftentimes connects to the small bowel. And in a subset of patients with uh, lymphatic congestion, there is spillage into the bowel, which then leads to protein losing enteropathy. And this has been confirmed with some, some fascinating work, again, done by, by Yoav Dori and, uh, and, and our group uh, in Philadelphia, where we've been able to isolate these tiny lymphatic structures, uh, perform lymph angiography, and even, in fact, inject some methylene blue into a lymphatic uh, structure in the liver, directly confirming its spillage of a, a lymph and protein-rich fluid uh, into the gut lumen. So this is the mechanism of, uh, of PLE. Now, what's interesting is that why doesn't every patient with a Fontan then ultimately have PLE? Uh, and I think it's a consequence of um, the four areas you see here, which are the physiological contributors. So you need the premise of elevated central venous pressure, some degree of altered tissue perfusion as a consequence of the Fontan circulation, perhaps some triggers of inflammation, uh, 
but then most importantly is the unique lymphatic architecture. We believe that in a subset of patients, a subset of humans perhaps, maybe five to 10%, which is exactly the, the, the prevalence of, uh, of PLE and plastic bronchitis in our Fontaine patients, perhaps five to 10% have a unique lymphatic architecture in which there are these unique connections between the liver and the gut. And so given this, um, this system that uh, this physiology with uh, elevated um, central venous pressure and lymphatic congestion, if you don't have these natural connections, the system remains congested and you don't have PLE. But with PLE, you have a break. You have spillage into the gut lumen that is a way for the body to adapt to the, its uh, Fontan circulatory state but it's maladaptive from the perspective that once, of course, the laws of physics take hold, which is you have a high pressure system and a low pressure way in which that, that system can drain, it's going to drain continuously uh, unless you can either alter the pressure in that system in some way, modify it, or seal the leaks uh, in, uh, in either the airway or in the gut. And so this is the model that we are currently functioning with uh, as it relates to, to PLE and plastic bronchitis. Let me just mention one more thing that, that I'd, I'd love to get some feedback from our adult congenital heart colleagues. And it's my own observation, and we have not published this yet, but uh, I do not believe that Fontan patients develop PLE or plastic bronchitis for the first time as an adult, no matter how uh, abnormal their Fontan hemodynamics may be, uh, that if you've made it into adulthood without PLE or plastic bronchitis, then in fact, you don't have these unique lymphatic connections uh, and that therefore to a degree you're protected. Now, there are patients who certainly have had PLE in childhood who have suffered for decades uh, and made it into adulthood with chronic wasting and such. But I think new onset PLE or new onset plastic bronchitis is not something we typically see in our adults with a Fontan. I'd be curious to hear of, a, uh, of your thoughts on this. Besides uh, spillage of lymph, uh, we do see lymphatic abnormalities in general in this population, and it can be manifested simply by looking at one's immunoglobulin levels or absolute lymphocyte levels, uh, which in a, in a low manner can be abnormal, indicative of some degree of spillage uh, and loss. Uh, the consequence in childhood is that we do see an increased frequency of um, things like molluscum or warts. And let me show you some, some examples of some of this. These are in children who um, have some significant degrees of lymphopenia are not in any way immunocompromised uh, in any other bacterial or viral infectious type of manner, but they do seem to have this predilection towards viral warts. Um, and in our patients with PLE, and these two particular individuals with PLE, uh, it can be quite traumatic uh, and quite problematic, uh, both not just from a cosmetic perspective, but, but, but certainly also we can develop secondary infections from excoriations uh, and such. And interestingly, when we look at the percentage of patients with an absolute lymphocyte count of less than 1,000 defined as lymphopenia, by age category, as you grow into your adult years, the likelihood of lymphopenia increases over time. Let's move on to another organ system that uh, early on is stressed uh, and needs to adapt to a Fontan circulation, and that is bone health and somatic growth. And we've done a little bit of work in, in this realm, uh, as have many others, looking at growth uh, in, during the growth period, uh, growth spurts in children, uh, have identified deficits in the functional muscle bone unit. Uh, and the origins of this, we believe, uh, relates simply to abnormalities in vitamin D uh, and parathyroid hormone axis uh, influence on bone health. 
and a bit of data that I want to show you that, that supports this. This is uh, from a series of over 200 patients, um, uh, mid-childhood to early adolescence, um, where we performed a series of DEXA scans to look at bone mineralization. And what I'm showing you here are the uh, mean and standard deviation Z scores uh, for these individuals uh, for both their height as well as the whole body less head bone mineral density Z score and the height adjusted lumbar spine Z scores for the bone mineral density, uh, again acquired through these DEXA scans. In green are our non-PLE patients, about 180 uh, Fontan patients, and in red are about uh, 30 patients with PLE. In blue is the, the midline for a zero Z-score, which is what you'd expect the mean to be for a normal population. Certainly the PLE patients are at a minus two Z-score, but even the non-PLE uh, patients have somewhat diminished growth relative to a general population. When you start to look at their bone mineral densities, Overall, non-PLE patients, significant difference. PLE, of course, quite, quite abnormal, uh, as well as for the lumbar uh, uh, spine, bone mineral density, PLE patients quite abnormal. And the non-PLE is closer to the mean, but still uh, significant. And when we look at their, their um, um, hormonal influences on this and primarily parathyroid hormone and vitamin D being the key elements that, that critically influence bone mineralization in childhood. Parathyroid hormone uh, was elevated in nearly half of our non-PLE patients and was 84% elevated in our PLE patients. So this defines secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, and it's, I think, at this point safe for us to say that in childhood, having a Fontan circulation means that you're likely to have or have a good chance of having secondary hyperparathyroidism. Now, why this is so uh, is still somewhat unclear. Could there be some element of renal dysfunction or such that may be influencing this? We know that, that there are profoundly low levels of vitamin D that exist in all of us, and this might be remediable through vitamin D supplementation. The kidney may be a source for uh, this vitamin D dysregulation that I'm describing early on. Um, and we do know that renal function early on is relatively well-preserved. But when we get to adulthood, uh, this is seen in more than 20% of adults and progresses with age. With, of course, the usual suspects of what contributes to this altered hemodynamics, the primary, one of the primary consequences appears to be uh, albuminuria with a progressive increase um, in cystatin C and serum creatinine levels, demonstrating a progressive decrease in GFR. Is there something else going on? Might there be a fibrotic change in the kidney? This is something that I think is quite interesting uh, and needs to be explored, and I'm going to touch upon this uh, uh, in a few moments here. But one organ that we know does fibrose is the liver. And this is a maladaptive uh, process uh, as uh, progressive fibrosis itself can interfere with uh, the task of the liver and liver performance. And uh, of course, the audience here is quite familiar with, with um, the, the notion of Fontan-associated liver disease, uh, of which we're continuing to explore its depths and its mechanisms and understandings, and perhaps hoping we might be able to modify this in some way. Uh, fibrotic changes are quite, quite common. Both central and portal fibrosis can be seen. Um, scoring the degrees of fibrosis can be a bit tricky. We, uh, in our institution, uh, still uphold what, what some might consider a controversial stance, but one that we think is valuable for individuals, and that's that we, we routinely perform a cardiac cath and a liver biopsy, as well as a cardiac MRI in uh, all of our patients that are at least 10 years out after a Fontan, to assess where they are in their course and to get as much information with all the limitations, understanding, uh, understand where they are and intervene in a proactive versus reactive manner. 
one of the ways that we're utilizing our liver biopsies is to provide uh, a, a comprehensive sense of the degree of collagen deposition in a field of view. And so this is something our pathologists have been helpful uh, with us by, by using a serious red collagen deposition uh, and grading both central lobular uh, as, a, uh, as well as uh, hepatocellular and, and other uh, regions of fibrotic change, uh, both portal and um, central venous, that can help us look at the overall burden of collagen deposition in a particular area. And uh, we've now used this tool to help us begin to understand perhaps some of the mechanisms um, so we've published uh, an initial series of over 70 patients um, looking at the serious red scoring system uh, and finding, in fact, um, a variety of, uh, of changes that we can now correlate with, uh, with other features, for example, such as hemodynamics. Uh, and when we look at hemodynamics, we find, interestingly, very little correlation between your actual pressure at the time of the cath and uh, some of these uh, serious red staining values. But one of the features that was most evident uh, and um, somewhat concerning that came out of this particular paper in 2017 was that there looked to be a significant relationship between the percentage of serious red staining per field of view, overall collagen burden, and age that as one progressed in age into the adult years, there were higher percent percentages uh, indicating the potential for a progression. Now, mind you, we don't yet have data looking at longitudinal assessment. This is a cross-sectional assessment of some younger and some older patients. Uh, of interest would be looking at, um, at this in a longitudinal manner and also looking to correlate some of the non-invasive tools that we may have uh, to help us uh, uh, grade more accurately the degree of fibrotic change. The coagulation system we know quickly uh, is, is affected in, in all of our patients with a Fontan. And um, at the moment, uh, some preventative measures, although still uh, active discussion as to the best techniques. And fortunately, uh, we do have the option uh, in the US now, as well as uh, in other centers around the world, to begin to utilize some of the, the DOACs uh, in our adult patients to, to help mitigate some of these complications. And this is a lecture um, a topic for a lecture totally in and of itself, but I'll just address it briefly here, and that's the, the growing burden of neurological and behavioral uh, challenges that many of our Fontan patients uh, present with realizing that single ventricle being one of the more complex forms of congenital heart disease uh, in this broad study, uh, AHA scientific statement demonstrates that more than half will have some degree of learning disabilities and such. And as you get into the adult years, uh, there are even more significant issues that relate to psychiatric co uh, complications and such. Here are some MRI images of newborns showing periventricular leukomalacia, some of the origins of the challenges that we see and then fast forwarding to the data that's now emerging using MRI to look at other regions of the brain and showing injury in regions that control cognition, anxiety, and depression such that two thirds of our young adults with a Fontan will have some forms of behavioral psychiatric morbidity and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Those of us that, that, that see these patients clinically, I'm sure will agree that we often spend uh, more time dealing with some of these challenges than we do uh, some of the, the uh, biological or medical issues. And of course, they're tightly intertwined one with the other. So in the, the next few minutes here, let, let me uh, sort of summarize a few things and bring this to uh, uh, a uh, topic of, what can we do next? How can we better understand what's going on? And what are our action items uh, to undertake in, in the near future? Um, much work continues in trying to understand the uniqueness of these individuals. And there's no question we have to do a better job in, in characterizing what is different about these unique uh, patients uh, as they grow into their adult years. 
but then let us simultaneously take what we now know and create more effective models of care. I think both of these are progressing at a reasonable pace at this point, but certainly more could be done. Let me propose one idea here that uh, is something we're thinking about, and that is that uh, although a lot of focus on the liver has indicated the presence of fibrosis, I think it's worth asking the question of whether having a Fontan circulation um, itself causes fibrogenesis, realizing the fibrosis is a biologically important process. Uh, might this be dysregulated in some way, manifesting as fibrotic changes in a variety of organs? The heart is, is, fibro is fibrosed. Uh, in our single ventricle patients, uh, which leads to arrhythmia and diastolic dysfunction, uh, perhaps progressive systolic dysfunction. I think no matter what type of ventricle you look at, a right or a left, if you uh, study it, uh, looking for scarring, uh, it's, it's quite a common phenomenon. And why might there be this, this overarching uh, process of, of fibrogenesis? It's because the origins of, of uh, uh, this may exist in the features that are present pretty much throughout one's existence with the Fontaine circulation, and that's some degree of cyanosis, some degree of perhaps systemic inflammation, hemodynamic derangements, and venous and lymphatic congestion. These drive up the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, mechanotransduction itself uh, can be a problem as well. There's vascular trauma that exists in these patients, which can lead to release serotonin. This is an area that hasn't been explored much, but uh, neither has the renin angiotensin system fully. But if any of these potential regulatory mechanisms are upregulated, then they lead to an increase in TGF beta 1, which is the common pathway to stimulate fibroblasts throughout the body to lay down collagen and perhaps lay down that collagen in both heart, liver, and kidney. And so this is a, a model that I'm proposing that I think is worthy of further exploration because certainly these are features that exist in all of these patients. And this is something we're starting to study. Uh, we, um, I'll go through this quickly. We have a, um, a cohort now of about 40 patients where we began looking at a variety of biomarkers of fibrosis and using some of the tools that exist in characterizing myocardial fibrosis using MRI techniques uh, in the heart, using MR elastography uh, in the liver, and then using a unique uh, set of sequences, uh, MRI T1 row imaging, which we think can help distinguish fibrotic change from stiffness, uh, which is uh, stiffness being uh, contributed to by both fibrotic change and uh, vascular congestion. And we're looking specifically for the fibrotic change. And we're now looking at our T1 row mapping time decays in the liver and looking at the kidney as well using MR elastography and T1 row imaging. And so this is work that's in progress uh, with some, some interesting findings I can tell you so far. Um, but these are the types of, I think, uh, analyses and ways of thinking that we need to approach this problem. Now, what can we do currently with what we understand uh, and how can we improve quality of life for these particular individuals? A fair amount of focus has existed to date on getting a patient to a Fontan, a lot of monitoring in the interstage period, much care as you uh, get to the Fontan operation itself with close attention to oxygen saturation and caloric intake, developmental assessments. We don't really have this type of detailed algorithm of follow-up for after the Fontan. And I would certainly make the argument, I think many will, will agree that uh, awareness leads to screening and surveillance. We know that there are a plethora of abnormalities that exist in this population. And we should be screening and develop proactive strategies for progressive care. And to date, we've been, uh, and still, reacting to complications that exist as opposed to beginning to think about what those origins of these complications might be, screening, intervening at earlier points in time. This has led to the development of, of Fontan clinics, I think, around the world. Um, we started out about 10 years ago, which is now called our Fontan Forward Program, 
that provides an ability to bring subspecialists together outside of the cardiology realm, offer comprehensive screening and cohort patients to collect data. Uh, our clinic is made up of cardiologists, a hepatologist, endocrinologist, and an immunologist. And we've recently added uh, specialists in these various areas that are so important, exercise physiology, mental health, nutrition, and education. Uh, this is just a picture of our particular team. We meet monthly uh, and see a series of Fontan patients that are brought to the clinic for secondary consultation. We don't function as their primary cardiologist, but as, as consultants. Uh, we adhere to some of the suggestions that have been made in the AHA statement, which um, I was uh, honored to, to chair, International Committee of Experts. We spent a fair amount of time trying to look at the various aspects of what we thought would be important to, to screen for. And some of these areas are uh, suggested and I think are quite familiar to, to the audience here as to what to begin to look for on a regular basis. Uh, in our Fontan patients. In our own clinic, the ability to cohort these patients has led to the collection of data and cataloging each of these individuals. And here you see some of the data that we're now be able to, uh, able to, to look at uh, and, and learn from. Uh, a variety of these patients are on uh, all sorts of medications. Uh, in this particular series of over 300 patients, 10% were on psychiatric or behavioral medications. We see a decrement in lymphocyte count and in platelet count as time goes on with age. We see an increase in GGT as time goes on with age. Uh, and these are biomarkers and variables that I think only through these types of uh, surveillance studies can we get a better handle on, on understanding uh, what's going on. We know that there are a series of patients who perform well uh, on exercise after a continuous circulation, beginning to study some of the, the really high performers, in addition to those that are having troubles and problems, uh, can be of value as well. And then we need to do this in a multi-center, multidisciplinary manner. So I'll finish just with these last few slides on uh, an embarking endeavor, something called the, the Fontan Outcomes Network. Uh, in which our goal is to create a learning network and a clinical registry that will map the trajectory of our patients from the point of getting the Fontan operation and beyond, way into adulthood. There are now 12 congenital heart centers who have signed on as the founding centers to uh, the Fontan Outcomes Network, where our goal is to collect data on 1,000 individuals in our first year, starting this fall, and 10,000 individuals over a three-year period of time. Truly cataloging their state uh, from a multi-organ perspective, starting in childhood and into adulthood. So what can we conclude? And I wanna thank everybody for, for your attention so far for this, and I hope we'll have a few minutes for, for some questions and some discussion. Uh, a pathway for survival for those born with single ventricle exists, but is full of challenges and hurdles. The Fontan Circulatory Syndrome, which includes these adaptations that we've just gone through, is not just a cardiovascular phenomenon, but rather a condition that involves all of the organ systems of the body. As more individuals survive, so is the recognition of a need to focus on discovery and research to better understand the variability in outcomes and identify modifiable variables uh, in order to improve quality and duration of life. Um, I completed my fellowship at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in 1992. Uh, and here we are. Um, I did not include 2022 because we're not done yet. But if you go to 2021, it's a quick PubMed search of citations that have the word Fontan uh, in it, uh, in their abstract. It's a growing, growing body of knowledge. Um, but we still are significantly deficient in fully understanding the, the manifestations and implications of what we've created. We don't yet have our bulk patients who are in their 40s, 50s, or 60s or beyond. My own personal belief is that we will see those patients. There will be individuals that will make it that far, and that burden will fall upon the adult congenital heart community to, to find solutions. But we in the pediatric community need to understand the origins of some of these and begin to do our work early on. 
So I want to thank you all for your attention here and uh, apologize if I've gone a little bit over time here, but hoping we can have some, some questions for discussion. I'll stop sharing my slides. Thank you very much for the excellent talk. We have we have time for, for discussions. And I think there's a lot of topics that you brought that uh, I'm sure that will bring uh, people asking questions. So if you want to ask your any questions, just either type it on the chat or unmute your microphone and you can ask the questions directly. While people think about about the questions I have, I can start. So the I'm very interested of, of the concept about PLE and lymphatic abnormalities. So as an adult, as an adult cardiologist and, and looking after only kind of ACSD patients, I've seen patients that didn't have PLE as a child in childhood or not diagnosed ever, ever until late in, in, in adulthood. So, and patients that come come already in transition with a bad PLE. And the patients that present early, n never had a PLE diagnosed in, in childhood, but present early PLE instead of late PLE. I was thought that the earliest the PLE, it does a thought that I had, and probably you had confirmed the earliest the PLE presents more lymphatic problems, more are, are the responsible for it. And the latest your PLE present, probably the other mechanisms might be the cause of that PLE. I don't know, that's that's again for discussion, yeah. but that yeah. is something in my head. My question about PLE and early presentation is, I know that your center is the, the leading center in intervention in lymphatic. So, of course, if you look at what you put the intervention in the algorithm of treating PLE, it's quite far down. And when you are treating, you just have to try everything. And at least in the, we don't do it. My question is, if we really believe that the lymphatics are the problem, which I think it might be, should we, or, or what is your, your protocol in CHOP? When do you consider an intervention for closing the, the lymphatics at in treating some a, a child or a, or a, a, a adolescent with PLE? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, a couple of things. So thank you for that, for raising that. It's a, it's a fascinating topic, and so I I'm proposing that um, that I think for the majority of, of PLE there is a lymphatic architectural abnormality. And then the 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 layering on top of that of, of elevated central venous pressure. But I would be curious. I do think that if somebody does not have PLE and they're 25 years old, they develop PLE for the first time at that age, that there may be a different mechanism uh, at play, or that in some way something has dramatically happened to say alter the central venous pressure. Maybe they developed AV valve regurgitation or 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 something in or ventricular dysfunction to the extent that now you've affected the other variable, which is uh, the, the, the degree of congestion that is there. But there is no doubt that for the majority of the earlier development of PLE and, and in more so plastic bronchitis, interestingly, it is a lymphatic circulatory architecture problem because the majority of our PLE patients, I'm going to say almost all, are patients who have hemodynamics that are no different than other patients that don't. And you can have terrible PLE and life-threatening plastic bronchitis, and your central venous pressure is 10 with a perfectly functioning ventricle and, and good cardiac output. So what is happening there, and, and we've shown this through the, the lymphatic uh, studies, is that they have abnormal connections. Whether these have developed or that they've been there, and then you, you, you raise the pressure and then they, then they manifest is, is not clear. And so that, you know, it's, it's challenging for us to assess the lymphatics or to subject patients to lymphatic studies before we do the front end. Uh, we're using some MRI techniques to help us with that, but you really have to do a lymphangiogram to know for sure. Um, but there's no question that the architecture uh, and the connections are the source of the problem for many of our patients. So we've put together an algorithm for, uh, let's take uh, PLE, for example, we put together an algorithm where we start initially with a you know, patient presents, let's say an eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old presents with hypoalbuminemia, ascites, peripheral edema. Take them to the cath lab, of course, assess their cardiovascular state, make sure there isn't anything wrong or that we could fix as best as possible with the Fontan, no obstruction, you know, AV valve regurgitation, ventricular dysfunction, those sorts of things. Most don't have it. 
Then we undertake uh, a sort of level one strategy of where we will uh, initiate measures to try and reduce the congestion as the source of what's driving the blood through the connections. Uh, and that includes pulmonary vasodilators, diuretics, anti-inflammatories uh, for short periods of time. You know, there's some controversy about the use of steroids and you know, uh, uh, corticosteroids in particular. Uh, we will uh, trial them for a short period of time, uh, but don't want to have patients on long-standing steroids because that can be even more, uh, have negative impact in, in, in conjunction with the, uh, with the hyperproteinemia. And actually about half of patients will respond to that alone uh, and do relatively well. High-dose aldosterone uh, inhibition, uh, we have found has been very helpful as well. If you fail that after, say, a six-month period of time of medical management, those are the patients that will then go to the cath lab and have a uh, lymphangiography. Uh, the lymphangiograms primarily are going to be driven with injections made in the liver to identify connections uh, into the gut uh, with simultaneous endoscopy. And then those connections are gone after and embolized. Um, so that's sort of the next step. We used to, as you suggest, sort of throw everything at these patients and then not be sure when the timing was for a transplant. But we've not transplanted patients for PLE in quite a while now. And so using that particular algorithm, diagnostics, assessments of any, any alterations in diagnostics, medical management, failing medical management, moving to lymphatic intervention, we've, we've been able to, to manage a fair number of patients. Now, there are those patients that we see, because of what we're doing from a lymphatic standpoint, there are many patients that are coming from around the country to us who've had 10 years of chronic PLE. And they are incredibly wasted, they're, they're troubled. Those are the most challenging patients. They're, they're, they're poor candidates for, for sealing these connections uh, and they're poor candidates for transplant as well, uh, interestingly. So, so those are the, the, the patients that continue to, to trouble us. That's a general, okay. general algorithm. I think it's a great, a great uh, algorithm. I think that, you know, that where I would, I would like to see in the future is where that the interventions lay in the adults because the adults are the ones that might have the years of PLE. Or I also believe that there are patients that might go through childhood with a silent PLE that actually they do have PLE, but they don't have clinical PLE and they present in adults. And, and that is probably some of them that might benefit from intervention. But I think it's a feel uh, it's, it's really fascinating. So unfortunately, we are we are over time. I could be asking you questions about this topic forever, but uh, it's, it's uh, nine o'clock and we have to, to close. Uh, I really, really enjoyed the, the, the talk. It's a topic that I, I really love. And uh, thank you very much for, for joining us today. And uh, to all of you that uh, joined us today, thank you for um, staying with us again. And we will be here in a couple of weeks. Some of you might be in Cincinnati next week, which is the North American Conference. If you are there, we will see each other. If not, see you here in a couple of weeks. And uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Dr. Richick. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.